Well, good morning. Well, good, good, hello, hello, hello. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is good to see you here today, and I love all of the fellowship going on and all of the conversations taking place and the smiling faces and the, the hugs and the greetings, and I hate to break that up as we get started this morning, but it is good to be here together today. We welcome you, those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us online as we come not only to celebrate the bond that we share in Christ, but to honor God for who he is and for all that he has done. Amen? And I'm happy to see so many of you who I feel like I haven't seen for weeks between being out of town on trips, between being out of town for sickness and all those different things. I feel like there's a lot of faces that I haven't seen in a while, but it is good to see you. Last week, we hosted our 2022 kickoff, and I'm here to uh, openly and uh, publicly declare and acknowledge that, yes, it was long. Um, it, it, did, it did go on, but, but with that said, I do appreciate, even though it went longer than we kind of anticipated, I do appreciate so much the kind words um, that were expressed by several, whether it was in person, whether it was through email, whether it was through text, uh, just for all of the things that they heard and, and how much they appreciated all that was shared. And, and um, we'll go ahead and at least let you know that we've already had some discussion about tweaks for the future um, to, to uh, hopefully make it a little more manageable um, in the coming years. But I do appreciate all those who are here, all those who have signed up for different things. Um, we do have a lot of the information in the back that was here last week. You can pick up calendars. You can pick up budget information. There's a little notebook. There's a Riverwood pen, and we want you to all to grab one of those if you were not here last week. And also want to make mention of the fact that um, there's a lot of, of different opportunities to sign up, to engage with what's going on here at Riverwood. So please take advantage of that. We have so many opportunities of things that are going on, uh, and not only stuff in the back, but even stuff on the volunteer board uh, back on the hallway uh, between uh, the two rooms, between the two classrooms as you walk towards the fellowship hall. We have a lot going on, um, and not only is our desire for every one of our church family to have some part, to have some role in what's going on here, to connect with a ministry, to volunteer for a need we have, but we need everyone. We need everyone engaged. We need everyone involved in order to do these good things that God has for us, the way to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, and even the opportunities to do so, to reach out to those in our community. So please, 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 if you were not here last week, stop by and check out those different opportunities to sign up and engage with different needs we had or different ministries, and stop by the volunteer board as well. I also want to make mention of our small groups uh, signups. We've had a huge response of, of numerous people who have replied to the emails. If you have not signed up to uh, participate or, or sign up for, for the small group ministry, please do that. There is a sheet in the back, and today if you can fill that out, just put two, three of people that you would possibly like to be connected with uh, within our small group ministry and get those to Greg. Um, if you don't do it, you can still email him and get that information to him, but please uh, take care of that today as we're going to kind of begin putting those uh, those groups together. Um, as you also uh, may know, we haven't had these um, in front of us for a while, but there's some little cards uh, in front of you. Uh, we put out the new communication cards um, just to help us uh, know what's going on with you, uh, to know your needs, uh, to know your prayer requests, uh, to know update of information as things change, as we need to be aware of things. Um, but that's what these are for. They're two-sided, kind of like they were before. There's a blue side and a green side. Green side is primarily for visitors. Uh, blue side is primarily for members. But this just helps us uh, to engage with you and connect you and even answer questions. You have those. So um, these are going to be uh, obviously available. And starting this week, uh, we're going to pick those up towards the end of services. Um, and so we're going to have some of our kids um, who will be picking those up. Um, we're going to give them kind of a role in what we do on Sunday mornings. And so they'll pick those up uh, at the end of services. But want to let you know about those. Uh, the, and, and hopefully you can get back in the habit of filling these out again as well as we move forward. Um, lots of other things going on. Please, please, please check your bulletin. There's so many things so much good information and so many things that we have going on and coming up. I uh, just want you to be aware of, want you to know about it. And all that 
section is in your bulletin. So please grab one. Please read the information in there and check it out. I'm um, just make mention of a couple of things. Our prayer walk is coming up this Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, so please bring a prayer walk and prayer breakfast. So please bring a breakfast to share at nine in the fellowship hall uh, to meet with those who are going to be there. And then also uh, in a couple of weeks on the 13th, we're having our Super Bowl Sunday. Haven't done that in a couple of years. And so looking forward to that opportunity. If you're willing to help out with that, to bring a soup, provide a soup, there's a sign up sheet for that on the volunteer board uh, on the way to the fellowship hall. So please sign up if you're willing to participate with that. But again, check your bulletin as there's a lot of other information about what's going on, about things that are coming up about when to be where to be how to be and how to be prepared for the different things that we have going on we are here today to praise our Heavenly Father and our presence here is an acknowledgement of his active work in us and around us and through us and so as we start this morning I'm just gonna offer a quick prayer of blessing as we open up our time in God's Word this morning God we love you so much God and we thank you God, our ability to see you and to know you and to connect you is directly related to our willingness to open our hearts to you, allowing who you are to take root in our hearts so that our lives are built on your solid, firm, and unbreakable foundation. So, God, we ask your blessings on us today as we praise your unending love. God, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Scripture reading for uh, today will be from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set for his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all in Judah, uh, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their very sight. They were looking intently to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed, as, dressed in white uh, stood beside them. Men of uh, Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Uh, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back uh, in the same way that you have seen him go to heaven. Let's pray. Father, you are such an amazing God. Your love and your grace that you shower down on us is unbelievable. We don't deserve any of it, Father, and yet you sent your son to die for us, Father. We thank you for that. This morning as we come together, may our songs be a praise to you. May the words that, that Martin shares just pierce our heart. May you speak to us and guide us. And as, as Andrew just read, Father, may, may we be your witnesses, witnesses in this community and all around us, Father, of, of your goodness, giving you the glory in all that, they, that we do, Father. You are so good to us. May we praise you and love you every second of our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing praises to our Father. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high 
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I've known that we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I. I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ, 
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I am yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost 
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Please be seated. Would you bow with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for these brothers and sisters that have gathered here today. And Father, we're thankful that we were all able to be here this morning. And Father, at this point, as we think of all the, the gifts that you bestow upon us every day, let us turn our minds now to that gift that you gave of your Son upon the cross mm -hmm. that we may have redemption for our sins. Father, as we take this loaf that represents his body, this fruit of the vine that represents his shed blood on the cross. We ask, Father, that we think of the sacrifice, the suffering and the pain, ultimately his death and his, his resurrection when he rose again and defeated death. And, Father, the opportunity that it gives us to defeat death ultimately in heaven with you. And Father, we just ask that we think of all those things as we take of this, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot you have taught me to say 
It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And Lord, is the day when the faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well, it is well with, my soul. with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of the virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, our Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified free forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried 
take my sins far away. Rising, he justified, free forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh, glorious When I was growing up here in Nashville, Tennessee, we did not have all the cool charts and models and everything that the guys and girls use to forecast the weather today. We had Bob Lobertini. And Bob Lobertini seemed to do about as well as all of those other folks do with all of their models and all of their colors and all of their predictions and all the other things that are part of that. I remember one particular time we were having some active thunderstorms around the area and Bob Lortini taught me something that I have remembered throughout my life. He said, if you want to know how far away the lightning and the thunder are, you count. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, one mile. So if you hear the thunder five seconds after the lightning, it's one mile away. And that is a skill, that is an activity, that is a calculation, if you will, that I've been using throughout my entire adult life, kind of counting that down. Lightning and thunder are always paired. Now, you may not see the lightning, you may not hear the thunder, but the two of them are always there. You can't separate one without the other. And, and people are generally split on which one is either best or worst, how we're going to characterize it. Lightning is without a doubt the more dangerous. In the last decade, 25 people on average a year died from lightning strikes in the United States. Nobody dies from thunder, okay? But that doesn't mean that that sustained rumbling sound as it rolls along can't be scary or impressive in its own right. Now I think of lightning and thunder when I look at the end of the Gospels and the beginning of the book of Acts. Because the res resurrection of Jesus it's a lightning bolt. It's a lightning bolt. White hot, instantaneous, momentous. One moment, as we sang just a few minutes ago, the lifeless body of Jesus is in the tomb. And then like lightning, in an instant, Jesus begins to breathe again. He is alive. And everything is changed. He is the first fruit that we talked about last week. He is now new life. The, the promise that we have of a future. A lightning strike. Now, when we step back and now we look at the book of Acts, 
Acts chapter 1 is the accounting of the events after that flash. It is the, the shock wave, if you will, that's caused by that blinding strike. And the events from that moment rumble and resonate all the way through, on and on. Not just in the book of Acts, but even down to our day. And the first deep chord occurs on a hillside outside of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus has been meeting his disciples many times recorded in the text. He was on the road to Emmaus with them. We discussed that a few weeks ago. He is in the upper room. He appears beside the Sea of Galilee. In the early verses of 1 Corinthians 15, there is a, a, a listing of some of the many individuals who encounter these events with Jesus. They seem to be fairly momentary. They seem to be unannounced. Jesus just kind of appears or shows up. In Acts chapter 1, we get to the ascension, and things are different. This time is going to be different. It looks like it is intentionally laid out for us as a marker, a final event, a, a decisive, deliberate withdrawal of Jesus here in about the next 20 or 25 minutes. I, I want us to... Listen as this important event resonates down the valley. And I will encourage you on your device or in your Bible, whether you are here in person or listening at home online, to turn over to Acts chapter 1. We're going to unpack that text this morning. Now, just so you'll know, I, we're going to spend maybe the first half of our time looking at the events that are part of this section, and then fill in some key areas of application that follow it. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, Luke focuses on this moment when the disciples are there with Jesus, and it starts with them asking a question that is completely wrong. John Calvin said that there are more errors in this statement than there are words. And he's probably pretty correct. The verb, the noun, and the adverb all address their doctrinal confusion. It is a marker of the fact that these guys may have been with Jesus for three, three and a half years, but they've not really been listening. And they really haven't caught on. John Stott, in his commentary, breaks it down for us like this. The verb restore shows that they were expecting a political kingdom. The noun Israel, that they expected a national kingdom. And the adverbal clause at this time, that they expected its immediate establishment. Other than that, they were spot on. Okay? So, so Jesus responds to that, and he provides some final clarity. He says, first of all, the kingdom is spiritual, not physical. Now, I know when we use the word kingdom, we're talking about a territory. It's kind of like a state. It's like a, it's like a county. It has boundaries. But Jesus taught throughout his ministry that the kingdom of God is not territorial. It is not and cannot be placed on a map. And the disciples aren't getting it. But that was not their only failure. Secondly, we observe that they kept connecting it to Israel, to the nation of Israel. And in fairness, look, that's what they had been taught for something like a thousand years. That's the way they had read the texts of the Old Testament. The Messiah, for centuries, he had chosen, God had chosen Israel to be God's people. And so they were the chosen nation. And the high water mark for that was the reign of David and Solomon, the united kingdom. 
And that was the way the nation was supposed to be. That's the way it was supposed to look. But when the kingdom divided, when they were overrun by pagan territories and pagan rulers, when they were taken into captivity, why that just wasn't right. Instead, there was always this hope. There was always this expectation that sometime in the future, it would be again how it had been in the past. Not as a political statement, okay? But they would have had t-shirts on that said, Make Israel great again. But you see, the concept was totally wrong. They thought that the Messiah would return Israel to that past glory. And that he would come, he would be a political leader. He would get rid of all those pagan nations. He would be a religious leader. He would restore to worship to Israel and to Jerusalem. But that view depended on a skewed reading of the Old Testament. You had to overlook the sins of David and Solomon. You, you had to... <laughs> You had to misread all those texts in the Old Testament that talk about the suffering servant. Well, we can even take this further because in what Jesus says to them, he shows that this order and direction of being his witness is different. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says that it is the rule of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people that mark the kingdom. It's not about Israel. It's surely not about the United States of America. Jesus is greatly broadening their horizons. And he provides marching orders that frankly will be seen and, and outlined, if you will, the book of Acts all the way rest of the book. It starts in Jerusalem, Acts 2 and 3. It then goes to Judea, then to Samaria, Acts chapter 8. Then the conversion of Cornelius and others. Uh, the Gentile mission, Acts chapter 10 and 11. Uh, again, it, this challenges their mistaken notion of the Old Testament uh, about 180 degrees. You see, in their reading of the law, the Messiah created Israel that was set on a hill and drew people in. If you want the perfect example of kind of what their thought process was, it's the queen of Sheba visiting Solomon. We've heard of how great it is and we just got to come see. But Jesus says that the kingdom of God is the opposite his disciples who go and who take the message to the world, to the nations. Oh, they also miss the timing. Th because they envision it as a specific moment. It it's references to clocks and to calendars. And Jesus replies in a couple of ways. First of all, he says... It's not about times or dates. Instead of focusing on some moment, instead build your life around this indeterminate time between the Spirit and the second coming of the Son. As Christ followers, they announce, they announce what Jesus achieved in his first coming and summon people to prepare for the second, whenever it might be. It's verses 6, 7, and 8. Now we go back to the story. And as this conversation closes, it records in about verse 9 or so that Jesus begins to float upward and again this is a break this is something completely different okay he's appeared and reappeared all the way through this previous 40 day period but I'm convinced that the reason now Jesus floats up is because this is a definitive marker 
that decisive moment when he is leaving. And, and the language is especially uh, emotive here. It is especially historical. Okay, listen to this. Listen to the choice of the words. Luke said he was going to give, verse 3, some convincing proofs in this second of his two-volume treatment of the life and ministry of Jesus and the birth of the church. So here are his words. They are taken before their very eyes. The cloud hid him from their sight. They continue to look intently. The angels, the men in white who appear, but, but they're angels, they, they, they are, are there next to them as they continue looking intently. And they assure them that Jesus will come back in the same way they saw him go to heaven. So we have three verses. We have five references to eyewitness activity and event here. And this piling up of phrases gives the text a sense of its authenticity. In the same way, I'm drawn to the fact that in the next verses, 10 and 11, there are references to sky and to heaven four times in two verses. And it emphasizes this key truth that has some important ramification. Jesus will come again. The angels tell him that as he is gone, he will return. Now, we ought to interpret that broadly. You can't just turn the film projector on and run it backwards. It doesn't mandate that if you're not on the Mount of Olives, you won't see it happen when he comes back. But it does speak to the certainty of the second coming. And furthermore, it says something about the disciples and the fact that they are not to be sky scanners. Their mandate is to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, not preoccupied with waiting, standing around waiting for Christ to come again. You see that upward gazing with nothing more than nostalgia for the past. It is to be replaced with an outward compassion to the lost world. Ultimately, there were two very different, almost opposite errors that the disciples are living in here. First, they were hoping for political power. And second, they are gazing into heaven, preoccupied with the earthly Jesus. And, and both are wrong. The first is too earthly, and the second is too heavenly. So what does this say to us today? I, I think at least three or four things. In the broader Christian world today, there are individuals who refuse, refuse to take this counsel of Jesus ser seriously. Y you go to their library of books, and they have an unending stream of volumes about the second coming and when the second coming is going to be. And, and they can go into all kinds of obscure, complex, text and they can do analysis from their cryptic uh, uh, figuring and arrive at an appending date. They know the time, they know the hour when the Lord is going to return and they make a prediction and it's almost always about 18 months or two years into the future and they're not original at that. Uh, predictions have been made since the first century they were made in the Middle Ages, and then once you got printing, and oh my goodness, now we've got the Internet. Uh, this stuff is all over the place. I, uh, this past week I was reading, there is a guy who says, when Russia invades Ukraine, that's the start of the rapture. That's the start of the second coming. That's all when it's going to happen. Get ready. 
He's wrong. And he'll be guy number 1,100,327,000. You got the idea who's wrong. That's the wrong focus. And it has been for 2,000 years. The date, the time of Christ's return should be of no particular interest to us. It doesn't matter. It's interesting but irrelevant. It doesn't mean one single thing to how I live my life or what I do. Secondly, this nationalism very easily gets tied into this. They had it. We develop it too. Alexander Campbell, many of the early restorationists, they were known as post-millennialists. What that meant is they looked around at the world, 1830s, 1840s, and they said, man, everything's getting better. Government's getting better. We're seeing democracies pop up. People are doing stuff. Religion is getting better. And so, therefore, we are moving into this golden age that will usher in the kingdom of God. Totally different perspective, but there's something known as Christian nationalism that's been developing within the last four or five decades, you know, where, where the United States is a Christian nation, and, and we are God's anointed we're God's anointed to stop communism and to restore what's right with the world. But both of those attempts, friends, are just as misguided and misplaced as they were when the disciples had that same vision of Israel. Now, I'm not saying that this wasn't a great nation, that this isn't a, a great nation, okay? I, I mean, you go back to the 1950s, there were a large percentage of people who attended church every single time the doors were open. And, you know, there were large percentages attended churches, services once a week, more than that. If you look at this chart, you notice it's been sliding downhill for a pretty good ways. But, but to glorify the 1950s, you got to whitewash racism and sexism. And McCarthyism and all the other isms that were struggles in our world. Look, Christ's kingdom is not national. It is of the Holy Spirit. And it was never about electing a certain political leader. I don't care what party they represented. Not Democrat, not Republican, not other. It's not about putting this nation on the right path. All nations are imperfect and are flawed and are sinful. The kingdom is not about the borders of any nation or state. It is instead about the hearts and minds of those who follow His Son Jesus and who are indwelt by His Holy Spirit. And that should help define our task. We are to be witnesses of what we have seen and what we have experienced and what God has brought into our lives. The message is to be taken to those who need it. And this is a massive shift from some of the evangelistic models that we have been using in our world for the last couple hundred years. I mean, listen, you go back to the early 1900s. How did we do evangelism? We had a gospel meeting. And, and what did we do? Well, we sang a song about it. Bring them in. Bring them in. What was your job? Your job was to invite your neighbor to the church. And there he would find a great preacher, a great person who would do an evangelistic sermon over and over again, but an evangelistic sermon. And we'd have an invitation and folks would walk the aisles. But you understand the model? In. Not out. 
And some folks got the idea, I want to hang on a second. God, gospel meetings don't work anymore. So what are we going to do? We're going to take the whole church and we're going to make it seeker sensitive so that we will have visitors around us as they're stumbling around trying to find faith in Jesus Christ. They'll show up and we'll have the right music we'll have the right type of lesson and we'll have the right type of everything we'll evaluate it we'll work it on it we'll get it all planned out we'll critique it the big question in the first was who's speaking second question is who's playing neither of those is the spirit of Acts chapter 1 folks the power is not in a cool production of the service it is most certainly not in a sterling speaker like myself. It is in the demonstrated power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. Do you understand that in many communities in our world, there is a time when a person makes a decision to follow Jesus and to be baptized, and they might come to where the church meet, and it is the first time they've ever been to church. Because they've been discipled, they've been converted in a study, in a contact with a friend, a neighbor, somewhere along the lines. Because church is for Christians. Church is for the saved. Church is for the disciples. And it's a powerful differential. In a few weeks, in a few weeks, we will start the Winter Olympics in China. And there will be all kinds of, of different plots and themes. There will be heroes. There will be villains. There will be thrills and spills. There will be tears of bo both joy as well as sorrow. But ultimately, it's going to focus on two moments when the victors cross the finish line and when those who have won receive their medals. I, I think of that when I think about the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension that we have studied this morning. Because in a sense, the resurrection, you see, marks the finish line to Christ's ministry. Sin is defeated on the cross, as Don shared in his communion thoughts this morning. And death is defeated in the resurrection. Jesus crosses the line. But the ascent... The ascension is when he goes back to the Father. The, the ascension is when he's really awarded. Now his work is done. And the work of the Spirit can begin. The thunder rolls from that lightning strike of the resurrection and it rolls down to our day and it reminds us to be properly focused on fulfilling the plan and the vision of God in Jesus Christ join with us together this morning as Rod leads us in a word of prayer to focus. To focus on the direction that, that Jesus gave to his disciples. That Jesus gave to us. Rod, come lead us in prayer.
Let us together pray. Our Father, as we come to the end of this time of worship to you, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for accepting our praise to you for a lesson from your word that helps us focus on your teachings and the privilege of sharing communion together. We thank you for that as well as a remembrance of your son's sacrifice. Please go with us now as we seek to live lives that not only encourage one another, but reach out to those who do not know you. For it's in your son's name we ask this prayer. Amen. Before I get into why I'm up here, um, for all, if you filled out any of your cards, if you'll go on and just pass those to the end of the aisle, and then we'll have our kids pick those up uh, now. Go on and pick those up now. We'll we'll try to figure out a good time to have them do that each each service, probably at the end. Um, and and kids, if you want to sign up for that, we'll have a sign up sheet, I believe, next week uh, to have you sign up to be able to do that during worship uh, each Sunday. Um, also, just a reminder, there are sign-up sheets in the back of the auditorium for different uh, ministries to be able to sign up for, so be sure and check that out on your way out. And if you did not get a journal um, last week, uh, please uh, pick one up as we have a bunch uh, back there and a pen, so be sure and get that. So as you know, uh, this year is our 70th anniversary of Riverwood, uh, which began in 1952. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing throughout this year is each month we're going to be looking at uh, just a different decade. And so for this month of January, we're looking at the first decade, uh, the 1950s of Riverwood. Uh, but before, uh, I have a video that, that's prepared that we'll watch here in just a second. Uh, if you were part of Riverwood at all um, in the 1950s, would you stand? Yeah, so, yeah. You, you can have a seat now. It, it's pretty neat to be able to look around and and... and and I think it's, it's neat to be able to see who, who has been here uh, from the 50s. Uh, but also, if you notice, there's a lot of people not, not standing, right? A lot of people who have come to Riverwood throughout the years, each of us, in, in different ways. It's pretty neat how God has, has continued to work, uh, not only in Riverwood's planning in 1952, but continues to work today in many different ways. And one of the goals as we kind of look back on just the history of Riverwood as we kind of go, go forward is, is not for us to look back for our own sake and to boast in, in different things that, that have been accomplished. But it's for us to be able to reflect and to look back on what God has done and what he continues to do throughout this congregation. Um, so I hope you enjoy uh, just this short video and then after that uh, you are dis dismissed. January 13, 1952, 324 people were present for Riverwood's very first worship gathering, which was held at Delwood Elementary just down the street from where we are. It was with the help of many different congregations, including Russell Street, Chapel Avenue, Grace Avenue, Trinity Lane, Riverside Drive, Leachy Avenue. These congregations came together to help plant Riverwood Riverwood worshiped at Delwood Elementary School, then transitioning once phase one of, of building finished in October, on October 19th, 1952, there were 361 people here to worship at this location in 1904 McGavick Pike. So why here? Why this location? And why then?
See, after World War II, this area experienced great growth. And in the 50s, you saw homes being built on Olga, Fremont, Milton, Ivy, Moss Rose, Shadow Lane, Sandy. From here to the river, homes were being built. There was great growth in this area. Over the course of the 50s, they had Thursday night prayer gatherings. They had Bible classes. They, they were able to, to host VBSs, gospel meetings, go door knocking. They gathered together for, for Labor Day camps, kind of like what we do today. They ate meals together. They enjoyed time together. They worshiped together. And most importantly, they worked to glorify God and spread His Word. This is a letter from the principal of Dalewood School to the Riverwood congregation. May we extend congratulations to the Riverwood Church of Christ on this happy occasion. It is always a joy and satisfaction to see a new house of worship. We too feel that we have made new friends from your group and have sufficient faith in these friends to believe that your church will continue to grow in the same remarkable way as it has done in the short time you have been organized. Thank you so much for the steps. I'm sure we shall use them many times. May God bless your church and may its people ever be in loving service to our Father in Heaven. With best wishes, I am sincerely yours, Thelma Gillum. As we look back on these last 70 years, it can be easy for us to look at the different things that were accomplished and boast in them, but that would be a grave mistake. Because nothing that has been accomplished has been because of us, but because of God. Because of His goodness, because of His faithfulness, because of His love. See, the Israelites had this problem of, of forgetting how God had delivered them. Forgetting His faithfulness, forgetting His goodness. David writes in Psalms 103 verse 2, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things God does for me. So as we look back on these, on this wonderful history, looking at our roots, let us make sure we are rejoicing in what God has done, giving Him all the glory. Let all that we do here at Riverwood praise the Lord. May we never forget the good things He has done and will do and continues to do for us. Mm -hmm.